Well, Hello. good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I okay. uh, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, welcome to another edition of Pull Quote. I'm JP and, and this is Julie. I'm Julie. <laughs> How is everybody this morning? Bright and early. Yeah. Uh, we are super excited to bring you John Stepling, who is a prolific playwright. Uh, we consider him a friend and we're going to have a great conversation this morning. And I think, um, you know, just to get started, I uh, think that... Uh, did you want to say something else? No, go ahead. Okay. I think that JP wanted to read a quote mm -hmm. that um, he recently picked up from uh, from John, and yeah. we're going to do an intro. Yeah, there's a little intro, too. <laughs> Sorry. So, well, we, was, it's all right. No, I, mean, I took we, over. I got so excited. I know. <laughs> well, and plus, you know, you've had your coffee now. Oh, yeah. We're, we're good to go. <laughs> okay. uh, John Stepling is an American playwright and screenwriter, and as, is an original founding member of Padua Hills Playwrights Festival. Um, and is the artistic director of the theater collective Gunfighter Nation. He's taught screenwriting and curated uh, the Cinematheque for five years at the Polish National Film School in Łódź, Poland, also known as Lodz for you English speakers out there. Um, his plays have been produced in Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Louisville, and at universities across the US and Europe. Plays include The Shaper, Dream Coast, Standard of the Breed, uh, The Thrill, Wheel of Fortune, Dogmouth, and Phantom Luck. Film credits include 52 Pickup and Animal Factory. He lives with his wife and filmmaker Gunhild Skordal, Stepling. They divide their time between Norway and the high desert of Southern California. John hosts the podcast Aesthetic Re Resistance, which is what we listen to a lot, um, and is a frequent guest on Press TV, where we catch him now and then. Uh, welcome to Prep Full Pro, John. Hi. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this morning or this afternoon for you. No, yeah. <laughs> I had a, I had a question. You're in Norway now. But do you guys go to? Uh, do you still go to Southern California? No, I have to update that bio. I think um, okay. we, we haven't been to to I haven't been um, to California. And, um, I went two years ago, right before the pandemic, but that was only for a few weeks. And prior to that. Um, the last time we went to Southern California was about eight or nine years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, we're pretty much in Norway now all the time. Um, and, and, uh, it's interesting cause I, I, I left Los Angeles, um, that last visit just two days before they declared the pandemic. So wow. Wow. I would have been kind of stuck there and had it been. <laughs> it would have been very complicated, probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't been back to Southern California for at least five years, probably longer. Yeah. Probably closer to ten. But yeah. 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 We uh, we left San Francisco about three years ago, and we're in now we're in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So this is where we were for the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, well, we'll get back to that because it, it, it falls into the area of, of culture that we were talking about. But I wanted to start from a quote uh, from your, your um, essay, Privatizing Emotions. Um, Samir Gandesha also quotes from a late lecture Theodore um, Adorno gave on Hegel. For this reason, therefore, uh, the quote, for this reason, therefore, we, may, we might say, putting in dialectical terms, that what appears to be positive is essentially the negative, i.e. the thing that is to be criticized, end quote. This is very much at the heart of Adorno's thinking, and it's related directly to the propaganda machine of the US. It, all, it is also tied into sentimentality and notions of positive thinking from Norman Vincent Peale right up to Joe Biden. The voice of the smiley face is dominant in Western culture. The smiling face is the alibi for any act of statism or cruelty and this smiling positivity is tied into pernicious, the pernicious idea of responsibility and duty. And this is something that we've been focused on a lot lately. Yeah. Um, coming from San Francisco, it seems like that is the um, poster child, as it were, for, for this type of um, um, behavior and, and attitude. In fact, our last um, essay that we did was focusing on a persona who embodies the very thing that you're talking about. Right. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think, I think this is um, a segue into, into, you know, an entire discussion about, about culture and, 
at least Western culture. Um, and, and it is something that, and we were just talking about this before the, before this interview, um, it's something that precedes the pandemic and it, it is something what we're trying to identify and will identify, I hope here, is a, is a process that began probably 40, 50 years ago. Now, my perspective is shaped by theater and then later film, television. I worked in Hollywood um, for a decade uh, <clears throat> doing just execrable scripts for for terrible people and, and um, you know but you get paid very well and you try to convince yourself that 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 makes it okay and in a sense it does. i mean everybody i i never fault people for for taking jobs um if it helps feed their family i mean you everybody has to do that and uh when i when i was in my early 20s i lived in los angeles and then in new york and I went to New York in, you know, 1972 and then again in 74, and I stayed 10 years. The difference for, like, young aspiring artists in whatever medium, the difference from the 1970s until today is dramatic. I mean, it's profound. And uh, I said earlier, you know, that that when I think back to the 70s, and this is in theater in New York, there was Off Off Broadway, Cafe Chino, La Mama, Theater Genesis, Sam Shepard, Murray Mednick, all these people. Um, uh, and nobody worked, nobody had a job. You know, the state, right. the, you know, John Lindsay and then the mayors that came after him were throwing money at artists. And the result was, an extremely um, active and rich cultural um, environment. And uh, that slowly dried up. And by the time I left in, I don't know, 80 or something, um, before that, probably 78, uh, it was already dying and it's completely dead now. And and you have to be a rich person to even live in Manhattan today. Right. Uh, that was mirrored in a in a slightly different way in in Los Angeles, and I think it was mirrored across the country in different yeah, ways. But um, there was a there was a sort of it was the beginning of uh, a very kind of organized assault on the arts and and culture in the U.S. and uh, you know, it coincided also with with the war in Vietnam. I mean, look, the the anti-war movement, the writing and and the alternative press that came out of the anti-war movement um, during Vietnam was profound, and it and it it was a significant factor in in um, ending the war. The government and they admit this and they've written about it. The government said we can't allow this kind of autonomy to the alternative um, media, to, to um, independent journalists. We have to do away with that. And so they did. It, be, it was the beginning of a constricting of, um, of uh, any, any sort of uh, autonomous voice. And in, in Hollywood, when I first got there, there were still working class artists. There were still writers who, like myself, didn't go to college. Um, and but we were being weeded out. You know, they right. they we have to stop using they. The, the <laughs> studio the studio knew that that we were um, less controllable and more of a problem in some fashion or other uh that that we would be a problem and so eventually uh we were kind of um, forced out and and uh by the 90s i wasn't getting any work and theater was ever more difficult to make more expensive to make the rents on theaters were were becoming higher and higher prohibitively uh expensive and uh, it marked the end of uh, experimental theater, and and um, and a whole kind of generation of artists were were left with nowhere to make art, 
unless they went into MFA programs right. in academia. Right. And that, that, was, that was the new ghetto for young artists. And it was a place to make sure that um, the creativity was beaten out of them one yeah. form or another. <laughs> um, and and yeah. the big institutional theaters, whether it's the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles or the Public Theater in New York or the Arena Stage or wherever, um, all those big institutional theaters were there to kill theater. I mean, yeah. Peter Brook, I think, was the first one who, who took note of that. But Herbert Blau certainly and other people did. Uh, you know, Blau was hired, um, was it by the public theater? I forget. Um, but he didn't last long, and I think it caused him a nervous breakdown. Um, on one of the podcasts we did at Aesthetic Resistance, Martin Epstein was on, who's a brilliant teacher, was at NYU, and, and he talked about what it cost Blau to try to work in the, the institutional realm Um of American theater. It was just deadly. So, so, you know, this is a long preamble to, um, to what you quoted there, which, which, you know, there's many ways to talk about this and, and, and ways to, to discuss the, um, the, you know, the dumbing down of the American mind, all of these, you know, this was the culture wars and people talked about it, but it is true that, that, uh, and I think the internet had a profound effect on this, screen learning, screen addiction, all of it had a huge effect. Um, people lost the ability to create young people today, um, will will spend almost their entire waking life staring at their smartphone uh and they don't they're shockingly incurious uh they 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 see it is like the drying up the atrophying of of subjectivity in a sense people have no inner life it's been um it's been colonized and and um I was just reading a, a piece written by Baudrillard the other day, and you know it's it's flawed as everything Baudrillard wrote is, <laughs> but but he had some profound insights. It was called the um, the ecstasy of imagination, I think. Anyway, he wrote it in 1983, and he was already saying that that um, something had happened. There was a shift that had occurred in subjectivity in the West that people saw themselves um, as if they were machines somehow, that that space, the kind of primal space that is part of the whole mimetic, you know, mechanism in, in humans um, had, had been taken over and uh, it, the, the, our inner lives had a new decor, as he put it. Uh, and and that people began to think in a way that was that was an imitation of computers in a sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is 1983, and De Boer right. said the same thing in '85. And that's that follow-up book to Society of the Spectacle, comments on the Society of the Spectacle, which might be an even more profound book than the first one. Um, he talked about a generalized autism in the West that that mm -hmm. that people, you know, and and. I have heard since the lockdowns began just offhand comments from people saying it is a, it is as if everyone is in a trance, everyone is in a, under a spell, um, and and that is what it feels like. People people um, seem uh, unable to to look at or examine what is in front of them, and 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 I think that that is something that began 30 or 40 years ago, you know, and, and, agree, and, just, yeah. and just got worse and worse and worse. And when these lockdowns happened, which probably, you know, um, probably were pretty well planned. I mean, there were, there were trial balloons for this sort of stuff sure. um, that the government put out. And, you know, I'm, I'm loathe. I'm one of those people that's really loathe. And I try to be careful and disciplined um, when we have these kind of conversations. One of these people who doesn't 
not only do I not want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, you know, so that, that's the most feared epithet. In, right. In <laughs> Better you're a child molester than a, than a <laughs> oh <my God>. conspiracy <laughs> theorist. Um, it really, it, 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 people just shudder and, and go out of their way um, to make sure nobody thinks they might be that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, um, so I try to be disciplined about it. You know, there's a tendency we all have to go, well, they planned this in advance. It's like, who is they exactly? And I want to know who they is, the ruling class, the government, you know, major corporate, who exactly drives the agenda here. And, and, and that's something one might reasonably ask with these lockdowns, right? Because the well, we government's response was irrational. Yeah. So we, Julie and I talk about this a lot. We, we try to figure out, you know, where is this actually coming from? And, you know, a lot of times we say, well, you know, it's like we're all living in a big corporation and there's different factions fighting for, for dominance at the same time. Um, something that you just said a couple of minutes ago really struck me. You said that there was a time in your life when it was clear that those who didn't have the MFAs or these, you know, prolific theater backgrounds or went to school for theater were pushed out. People like you were pushed out of the theater world um, to make room for these sort of cookie cutter uh, theater types. It feels as though we're kind of going through the same thing. Like everybody in the working class and everybody in the, the lower class is, be, is being pushed out and only the bourgeoisie are left. Only you know the billionaire class are left. Um, it, it's well, it's, it's like the same, you know. But 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 absolutely so. I mean, working class voices have been silenced. There are no working class voices in in um, you know mainstream media. There simply aren't none. Right. And um, if they try to manufacture a sort of token working class voice um, in the name of diversity, perhaps, or something. Um, that voice is thoroughly vetted before anybody hears them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's an insidious system, but, but uh, the, the, the frightening part of it is that um, while the working class has been eliminated, their voices have been silenced, uh, much of the working class suffers the same um, screen damage, the same cognitive impairments that that the you know the bourgeoisie. I mean, if you look at the response to COVID, the most enthusiastic, virtue signaling, um, mask wearing, social distancing, um, uh, you know, responsible citizens are that educated white thirty percent. That, that Chomsky right. identified a long time ago as as the demographic targeted by advertisers and so forth, um, and and those are the people that have have entirely bought into it. Now, you know, there's a whole sidebar discussion to have um, that we could label the Trump effect on sure. that, sure. you know, because so many people. I mean, that you know, the fear of being called a conspiracy theorist was rivaled. By being called a Trump supporter, right? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure which was seen as as um, the more reprehensible. It depends uh, on where you were, but, yeah. but they overlapped, right? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, everybody has has been affected psychologically by the internet, by social media, by all of you know the 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 of the, the a culture, a society. Uh, run by the logic of algorithms and 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 yeah, it's really hard to tweeze apart all of that. I mm -hmm. think, um, and you know, here we are on screen talking to each other. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's no escape from it, and right. and we're hopefully um, overcoming the pitfalls of it. But I'm never entirely well, sure. It's funny because, uh, you know, I'm a, I grew up or, or came of age just listening to radio. I love radio, radio interviews, radio programs, and, you know, anything on the radio. I loved it. 
Um, this to me seems sort of an extension of that in that, you know, we are, we are geographically separated and there's no possible way that we could possibly talk to you like this in any other context. Right. Um, so to right. me, you know, this works out, but I take your point precisely. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to mention that, you know, here in Pittsburgh, um, we have, because we're not from here, you know, we can look at things uh, much differently. And we see the the illustration, we see this as an illustration of what you just said. Right. We live around the very poor and the very, you know, and the working class people. And, but at the same time, there is, there are a few neighborhoods in Pittsburgh that are, are very um, um, wealthy. Um, and there's, you know, two major universities right next to each other <laughs> yeah. in the same neighborhood. And that are kind of driving this, uh, you know, we, we don't have to get into this topic, but they're driving the, mm -hmm. like the transhumanism uh, agendas agendas of the future. And, and, of, the, bio of that. And, and, the, and the bioethics and things like that. Right. We're in those neighborhoods, the affluent neighborhoods and the university neighborhoods, you know, the masking and the social distancing was the most hardcore. And right. throughout the city, you would see the masking much more than when you would get into the outer neighborhoods like ours, which is, you know, a bus ride away from downtown, but it feels like another, uh, you know, another world altogether. Right. And it's sort of the ass end of the ass end of Pittsburgh. And the people around here <laughs> were, um, were not wearing masks at first, but because they had to go to jobs like security, jobs you know as security people at you know large buildings or they had to you know do whatever they had to do um they adopted the masking as as re requirement and then it culturally started you know dispersing out into you know larger areas right and you know they're the first to 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 drop it but at the same time there's still a lot of people around here that you know really embrace that i am I'm remembering a comment that Vanessa Mealy made um, when she was being interviewed a few weeks ago, and it it really applied to you know our neighbors and the people that live around here, which is that you know the people who are in Syria, for example, they're not really worried about COVID, and that's kind of how I feel about the people, the working class around here. They're just doing their job. They're not really. COVID yeah. isn't the center of their conversations, of their life. Um, it's just, it, I just thought it was an interesting parallel. Um, well, no. look, the, 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 um, the visibility in media um, is, is um, there's no equality to, to who is visible and who, you know, there's a class you know, demarcation. And, and so the, the hot bourgeoisie, usually white, but, you know, increasingly there's a kind of woke uh, inclusiveness or something. Um, but, but uh, you don't see the skeptical um, working class, the people who don't buy the master narrative about COVID, there's enormous skepticism. And you see it with the protests around the world. There are massive protests in England, in Austria, in Germany, in Paris, huge, huge protests against the lockdowns. Um, but, uh, you know, what effect have they had? I'm not entirely sure. They've had some effect, but this is like the lead up to the Iraq war. Right. Millions of people on the streets all over the world, and it it didn't stop them for a heartbeat. You know, no, they, not at all. they went right ahead and, and yeah. with their plans because they feel um, they feel untouchable. Uh, I would like to think they are not untouchable, but it's going to require a kind of majority movement of people and and um, who will stop being quite so afraid of everything. Mm -hmm. And fear is a huge part of the, the propaganda machine. But I wanted to mention one thing because you just mentioned that reminded me of it. Um, you know, Adorno said that 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 the the two things well, he said a lot more than two things <laughs> that he said were that that the radical nature of art is to be found in its uselessness. Hmm. Um and and sort of 
an adjunct observation to that was that uh, art is the the profound truth of art is not found in its opinions. What he meant is that there is a question of form and content to be simplistic about it. Um, and, and an example would be, I remember seeing a film put out by a major Hollywood studio uh, with all the involvement of like William Morris and all of these, you know, different agencies and monies. And it was a big studio summer release and it was um, ostensibly, I mean, it was a sort of action film, but it was ostensibly about um, pollution and environmental destruction from big corporations, right? Now it's being produced by the very corporations that that are being criticized in the film, in a sense. And the film ends with a long speech about we have to stop, you know, allowing corporations to take over the world and da 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 da. da. And it was kind of a great speech, actually. Um, and then you know, roll the credits, and that was it. And uh, I thought the studio doesn't care about that speech, the content of that speech because the form of the film is just like every other summer, stupid summer formula action film. So the film, in spite of that speech, is a reactionary film. It fits into the, the framework of, of everything Hollywood produces, which is profoundly reactionary and pro-military and jingoistic and all the rest. Um, and that, that, I realized that, you know, you, you can't you can't be heard. The content, if if you're interested in in expressing a critical content, you can't do it through a reactionary you know system of that is you know a, a hegemony that Hollywood holds over over screens globally. Uh, is just going to be neutralized. They neutralize dissent a variety of ways, but that's, you know, that's one of the ways because people have to understand. It's why agitprop is always so um, disappointing in some way um, and finally kind of superficial because that's not, it's a tr trivial form of expression finally. Uh, and And, you know, you could look at, the greatest films ever made, which, you know, I might nominate Pasolini's Gospel According to St. Matthew. This is not a political film on the surface. It's based on, you know, the Gospel of St. Matthew. Um, in fact, the entire text is taken from that. And, um, but it's an extraordinarily beautiful film that is extraordinarily unsettling and, and, sort of psychically disruptive in some way um, and is far more radical uh, than, you know, the San Francisco Mime Troupe might be because the form of that Pasolini film is so unfamiliar and so startling and, and um, one experiences it in a way completely other than what one is conditioned these days to um, the you know to expect and and the ways in which one normally um, consumes cultural product in in this system, and and the problem is today that 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 hegemony is so acute and so pronounced that uh, there is less and less uh, autonomous independent. Uh, content that that one can access, and and we're seeing that with the you know the rise in censorship on the internet, of um, the deplatforming of leftist sites, um, Marxist sites, anything that is not um, completely aligned with with the master narrative. And you look at you know Facebook. I recently deactivated my Facebook account. I mean, I've hated it for a long time, but I finally got off because I thought this is enough. Because um, I kept getting warnings about this is misinformation about COVID. And this is just my opinion. How you know? And I'm quoting a, a a doctor with 50 years of experience. How can that be? Um, how can you be certain this is disinformation? There's no debate. Alone. No on screen. Show show John. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, the absolute removal of dissent.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that there's no debate. There's no referendums. There's no town hall meetings. There's nothing, right? Um, and and uh, uh, nobody has asked the government for for any of this either. So um, I know in Norway this became something of a topic, but um, but a very minor one. It has been government by decree. So anyway. Um, did, did, did you, you notice? notice uh, did you notice that we left for a little bit? <laughs> yeah, there was a glitch there, wasn't there? Um, yes, we we had a complete and total power outage. Everything went down for about three minutes. We lost all power, all all connection. But huh. okay, um, well, I, I didn't. I noticed something, but it wasn't. But it wasn't on your okay. end. But it wasn't on my end, no. Yeah. Okay. okay good. That's good. So, um, so we, we were afraid that we would have had to start over and like get you know get you back on and and start the 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 recording over again. But it looks like everything's running and it kept going even though we lost complete power here. We lost total power. Yeah. Huh. Um, we had some serious thunderstorms yesterday. Um, and could the audience please let us know if you can hear? Um, me or JP, okay. Juniper was really good at making a comment uh, early. Somebody else said that it only dropped out for a few seconds. That's thank you, Melissa, for that comment. Um, please let us know if you can hear us. Um, uh, earlier on, Juniper said that JP was couldn't that JP couldn't be heard. So okay. we're just you know technical stuff. We just want to make sure that yeah uh, yeah. Uh, Everything is in working order. Um, Above my pay grade, uh, the technical. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, we're we're, we're fairly technic technically savvy, so we're you know we were able to recover. Yeah. What I would like to do. Um, so there is feedback between the mic. Uh, somebody is saying so that could be on your end, on Mr. Stepling's end. Um, but I think that I think we're okay over on our end. What I would like to do is read something from uh, Checkpoints on the Frontier of Desire, uh, which was one of your pieces that I loved. Yeah. Um, so let me let me start. And you know, if you guys have trouble hearing me, just let me know. Uh, Nicholas Rose notes that medicine has undergone an epistemological change if not an ontological one. This mirrors in an odd way, the evolution of psychoanalysis, the search for a deep truth, for underlying causes or meaning has shifted or flattened. To put something resembling open-ended systems of prediction of computer modeling and risk management, the deep trauma Freud thought is replaced by surface adjustment. This is the capitalization aspect too. Medicine resembles economics, but it also has changed the perceptive, the percep perspective of what sort of values one attributes to being human. Much like postmodern theory in general, there is a privileging of the surface. Mm. Truth is in the service of algorithmic experiment and always looming over these open circuit systems is the goal of prediction. There is a control and domination aspect here, a securitization and optimization of results. The actual diagnostic gaze or the doctor has receded into near extinction. Okay, that's heavy. <laughs> well, it goes along with like the cultural aspect we were talking about. Um, well, yeah, I mean, um, you know, one of the things that you are seeing um, at at this very moment is with the reset, the great reset, mm -hmm. is is the attempt to transition um, everything like healthcare to telehealthcare, education to um, teleeducation, um, and um, distance learning. There's a lot of euphemisms that go along with this. Um, and, and the further digitalization of everything, all in the service of, of, you know, a massive, um, uh, architecture of surveillance and, and tracking and, and control. And, and, um, 
before the power outage, we were kind of touching on that, 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 you know, you see, um, with, with ideas being floated and, and with the attempt to push through things like vaccine passports and digital wallets and, and all of these things, um, are really just, a, a um, an attempt to further refine, you know, what is already a system of control. And, and, you know, the, there's also going to be the thing that frightens me on one level the most, because I have three small children. Um, and yes, I'm really old to have three small children. But anyway, um, is the restrictions on travel. And, and you know, Hiroyuki Hamada wrote a great piece a while back last year about feudal Japan, um, medieval uh, Japan, and that one of the ways to sustain that feudal system was to um, profoundly limit people's ability to travel, to just restrict movement altogether. Yeah. And, and that's what you're seeing. I mean, the rich have never stopped you know, private jets have never stopped going in and out of airports this whole last year and a half. Right. People yeah. masks, you know, I mean, I love that the G7 photographs of the Queen and all the different various billionaires and and unmasked and the waiters and um, right. you know servants mm -hmm. all wearing masks. And I thought, well, ruling class really is just laughing at people at mm -hmm. this point, um, and and that should upset um many but it seems not to and that's a whole topic too that's but but you mentioned but you mentioned culture i'm sorry and and um you know i just as a a sort of footnote or sidebar there because i mentioned psychoanalysis this was the originally an insight i think that russell jacoby um who's a terrific writer is in los angeles and and he was at ucla for a little while but um, underappreciated writer, and he wrote a book called Social Amnesia, which was about what happened to psychoanalysis when it traveled across the Atlantic to the United States. That that the the what was radical, and in many, you know, in in many of the original Vienna Circle Marxist sensibility, a socialist sensibility. Um, but a but a radical search for truth um, at its core was changed as it got to America. It was professionalized. It was turned into um, uh, an adjustment therapy, an adjustment to the status quo. The idea was to make your life work and to make you an efficient worker, um, an efficient cog in in this machinery of oppression essentially essentially so that was mirrored that the the narrative the fable of psychoanalysis in a sense which became something much else when it came to the u.s um is is um duplicated or mirrored culturally in in all kinds of other art forms i think uh you you just see the the um the elimination of, of um, disruptive uh, experience that that mm -hmm. you know, it was the rise of entertainment. I mean, Adorno and Horkheimer called it the you know the culture industry, but they were talking about entertainment, and it's an insidious word. It's an insidious idea, um, and it's reactionary. The same way that you know. Um, kitsch and sentimentality and all of these things are always reactionary. I think it was James Baldwin said, sentimentality is the mask of cruelty. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and this, this is true. And I, cause I've tried to talk about this at different times that, that the, the sentimental feel good, smiley face, a happy ending uh, template that Hollywood to this day embraces um, Ha, it contains a certain violence. There is a certain um, intellectual or emotional violence, I think, that, that runs alongside that. It is, it is not innocuous and unimportant. People 
have a tendency, I think, to say, oh, well, it's just a movie. It's just entertainment. Who cares? You know, it was really fun. You're such a you're such a buzzkill. <laughs> and um, and it's not just entertainment. Nothing is just anything. Everything has meaning. And right. and certainly um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, has enormous meaning. It, uh, of sad but it does yeah. um, as does just about everything turned out by this this machinery of propaganda really so well we, we, we've noticed there's a lot of you know toxic positivity uh, lift uh, was lifted up during this last year something that's yeah. been on the edges for a long time and something that we experienced in San Francisco for decades and only now we're seeing it uh, you know writ large. Well, um, you look at things like uh, the the use of the word hater. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you're just a hater. <laughs> uh, and I saw the funniest thing, this is just funny as shit, was I, I saw there was a book, book release because, you know, Heidegger's Black Notebooks got published, the ones where he, he talks about, you know, I mean, his just rabid anti-Semitism and, and mm -hmm. fascism and that it was a, that, 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 exterminationist ethos was built into his thinking from from the beginning um anyway his black notebooks were published and everyone said okay so okay he was a nazi you know and this one book came out haters are gonna hate does it matter that heidegger was a nazi wow that was the title of the book and i thought <laughs> you know Oh, I mean, come on, don't be such a, you know, picky, picky, picky. He's a Nazi. Um, but, but you know, the, the popularity of those terms um, is not accidental. You know, they're promoted by the system. The system right. reinforces and validates that kind of stuff. Celebrities use that. It's repeated on Oprah. It's repeated on Good Morning America. You know, oh, don't be a hater. Blah, 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 blah. Um, what that means is don't have a critical opinion mm -hmm. um and and you're not allowed to voice it if if you you know if you secretly do um so so it it it's pernicious it's um and it 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 manifests itself in all kinds of i think unexpected ways and unexpected places people have a tendency to again to disregard um the the trivial uh um advertisements and marketing campaigns that one is you know saturated with um these days and and yet um it doesn't take much to to deconstruct them a little bit and see what what is driving them and it's always um deeply reactionary you know right um there is a uh, can you hear me okay can you, hear me? can you hear me okay. yeah i mean aside from the blown speakers on my old uh, laptop <laughs> I, I can hear you okay good um there is a term that you brought up in your piece uh, that i just quoted from checkpoints on the uh, frontier of desire uh, on your website, which is johnstepling.com, by the way, um, that you brought up a term I've never heard before. It's well, it's called graphomania. Can you explain wh what that means in today's context? Um, I, I I kind of took it to mean the same as like pro, uh, an overabundance of writing or scribomania or something like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about graphomania? Graphomania. Well, um, it's funny, the first time, um, I actually, the first time I ever heard that term was in that documentary about R. Crumb. Okay. Uh, be because his brother uh, uh, suffered from a, a form of graphomania. Yes. Uh, which was just obsessive compulsive, um, writing um, and which eventually devolves into just just scribbling right right but he fills notebook after notebook after notebook with scribbling um but it is it is i see it as a symptom um of of the empty verbiage and and uh 
uh, empty kind of but incessant content of of this marketed culture um and and it is you hear it uh if you listen to politicians i mean you you hear it if you if if you listen to political speeches or or the representatives of government you hear it from celebrities you hear it on talk shows uh it's it's interesting to compare i mean again these are you know on one level perhaps banal examples but if you if you go back and watch a episode of the tonight show with johnny carson from 40 years ago right and compare it to one of the late night talk shows today just listen to them and listen to the, the language mm -hmm. um it it has deteriorated i mean there's fewer words used mm -hmm. sentences are simpler um there's a great essay actually needs i digress all the time you have to forgive me um by franco moretti that's in new left review about the grammar and uh, language of the World Bank, that, that it's a very particular sentence construction, a very particular grammar that's employed and that that has now bled into discourse in general throughout society. Um, and I encourage people to read that one. It's great. I've quoted it a number of times on the blog because it's, because it's a very cogent, uh, point that he makes and and so um you can see it with film i mean as i say you know it the the golden age of american film and it was still studio film but was the 1940s post-war america you had all these german emigre directors german jewish emigre directors making film noir they were handed these kind of potboiler scripts um crime scripts detective scripts whatever um genre material and they turned it into something else they turned it into something often rather profound and and the kaye critics the kaye de cinema critics um godard among them uh were were the first to, to recognize this i think and um find something uh unsettling and counterintuitive in a sense in in a lot of the film noir in in from 47 48 49 1947 is probably the greatest yeah. year ever for me we, we just we just but, screened, but, um we just screened in a lonely place right we just watched that recently so oh it's great right yeah yeah, yeah. the <laughs> ultimate in noir right, right. <laughs> so i mean there's you know um um there's extraordinary films um uh, in a lonely place of Nick Ray, uh, you have the, um, the Jacques Tourneur um, thing with Robert Mitchum, uh, the name of which is escaping me. Lancaster was in a lot of films by Robert Siodmak. Um, there were extraordinary, um, extraordinary things, even Preminger's noirs, Angel Face, um, mm -hmm. Where the Sidewalk Ends, uh, are incredible. And you compare them or any of billy wilder so ace in the hole watch ace in the hole um it it is amazing to compare them to what you have today i mean studios largely make uh summer blockbusters and a, one or two prestige films uh, but it's increasingly people don't go to the movies anyway people watch stuff um in fragmented fashion on on their laptops and it's too expensive to go to the movies and that's not how they consume this stuff anyway from the time hbo came upon the scene home box office the idea was that it was better for people to stay at home the pandemic you know aligned with this rather perfectly and you could customize your viewing experience at home in a way that you couldn't if you if you had to go to to the theater where you had to sit in the dark and shut up and you know um actually pay attention to what was on the screen um so yeah it it, it the stuff turned out today is is you know i mean largely unwatchable and um there's economic reasons for all of this of course but um i i saw it 
uh, when I the first film credit I had was 52 Pickup. That's 1985. And um, over the next 15 years, I watched the changes happen. And direct John Borman made a film like Point Blank. That, I think, is 1961. Um, and he has said, I couldn't make that film today. It's impossible to make. Mm -hmm. Brian mm -hmm. Palmer has talked about it. Um, a lot of those directors that came up with the, you know, the British New Wave, John Schlesinger and um, Tony Richardson, you know, they were no longer able to make the kind of films they wanted to make. And and I think it, it cost them. I mean, Joseph Losey with scripts by Harold Pinter, Accident and and The Servant. These are films that won't, would not, you, you can, how could you pitch The Servant today to a, any, you know, funding organization? It, it would be impossible. Um, so, so the golden age of cinema has passed. The film as art has passed, that's over. Um, uh, there may be, you know, the occasional outlier, but uh, I remember in the 70s in New York when it was my introduction to, to film in a sense, because I was surrounded by very serious cinephiles and you could, there were 10 art houses showing whatever the latest Antonioni or Fassbinder or Bresson and on and on and on, um, Pasolini. Uh, that stuff was was current and there was a audience for it that was literate enough to appreciate it there was a something of a public discourse about it um and and a discussion about it there were even a handful of critics that could write intelligently about it all of those things are gone you see and and in theater there is simply no audience left for serious theater at all. I don't think anybody even knows what serious theater is. And, and I did a workshop in LA when I was there two years ago, right before the pandemic. Yeah. And I said, if, if you're a theater artist, if you're a playwright, you have to think of yourself like one of the desert fathers out in, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the wastelands of, of the Egyptian desert in a cave um, presiding over Coptic texts that nobody can even read anymore. That's, that's what you are. And you have to come to terms with that, I think. Oh, uh, because yeah. if, if you go, if you get caught in the machinery and, and you think somehow you can trick the machine and, and make a meaningful film in a system designed to erase meaning mm -hmm. um then you're deluding yourself because it, it it's pretty much impossible look things get made there are still good things that get made and that's that's a complicated and lengthy discussion because i think the only good work today is largely done in genre format perhaps paradoxically but um uh I think it was Lacan who said, you know, our mothers can only love us as criminals. Um, in that's my that's my <laughs> point to um to to why genre um material seems to somehow work best in a in a uh, a context of 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 film of cinema, but you know even even cinema has suffered digitalization. You know, films upon release are already digitalized. Mm -hmm. And so that whatever it was, 24 frames a second or whatever, 16 for however many frames a second, um, that flickering hypnotic um, beauty of original film that I think mm -hmm. all of us of my age fell in love with um, and and uh, Scorsese talks about this, mm -hmm. you know, with some sadness. Uh, that's gone. That's gone. And, um, you know, he's an, he's an interesting and almost semi-tragic case uh, because he's wonderful. If you listen to Scorsese talk about film, he's a, he's a wonderful critic. He's absolutely encyclopedic, you know. Um, and, and I may be the only person that's seen as many films as Scorsese, I think, but... <laughs> But then he makes stuff that is just increasingly terrible, you know, mm -hmm. 
Um, <laughs> the Irishman was essentially an animated film. Right. Um, the the advent of CGI has 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 been a horror show for the aesthetics. I mean, look at Kubrick's 2001. That was pre-CGI for the most part. Mm -hmm. So he had an army of artists painting, you know, backdrops of little stars and building these miniature spaceships. And then he would film very carefully this hand-painted thing. And there was a sense of space and authenticity to those images that disappears when you do it by computer. Right. And um, it it is just one of those inexplicable things, I suppose. But but computer generated image is inherently ugly and and regressive. I don't know other. Another one to say. Well, it. you know, I mean, even, you know, you mentioned animation and, and the hand painting. I mean, even if you go back to like the old Warner Brothers cartoons, where they were using yes. cells, and Disney, where they were using you know stacks of cells right. that gave Absolutely. that depth. You know, look at I. I have three small kids, right? I have twin boys who are four years old. So, you know, um, when on those rare occasions we let them sit in front of the television. Um, kids cartoons i can't i'm mean, it's like i'm horrified you know? Yeah, I know it's all drawn by computer and faces have no movement or expression right and i think that you know and mouths don't sync up with the sound coming out of these cartoon mouths and yeah you compare that to disney cartoons from the 1950s which were overdrawn, you know, Disney didn't mm -hmm. pay his animators, but they did extraordinary work. Right. Um, somebody's going to do a biopic on Disney someday, um, a, a monograph, because he's an interesting figure in mm -hmm. American culture. But yeah, no, it's, yeah, the difference is profound. It's a profound difference. There's no question about it. And um this relates to that generalized autism we're talking about. I mean, there's been a number of, of psychoanalytic works written um, uh, about this, the, the loss of um, the ability to read expression and faces and um, whether it's Botoxed mothers whose faces don't work right and the infant misreads things. And now the masks. I mean, the masks are a perfect expression of they this. Yeah. How how much better could it be? You know, than um, you don't see the face at all. Uh, and and the fact that so many people have decided. I read something, people talking about, it, and I know them here. So I'm I'm going to keep wearing my mask. I feel safer with it. I don't know. Yeah, not for the reasons you think. I suspect, yeah, but I know. Yeah. It's a blankie. It's know. a blankie, yeah. It's, 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 it's a, you know, it's sucking one's thumb or, or you know, pacifier. Yeah. Make it feel <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's, it's hard not to, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. What were you going to say? Go ahead. Oh, well, I wanted to just, you know, go back to theater. This is kind of a loaded super question, but do we have a future? in theater do we have a future in the craft at all or has this digital divide replaced the craft yeah you know let's talk about theater for a second um the short answer is no i don't think it has a future right now in in the sense that you're asking that question but um i think there there is always theater I'm of the belief that theater is like the er art form. I think that, you know, people always say, well, theater came out of religion. No, it's the other way around. Religion came out of theater. Theater comes first. And theater at its most basic primordial level is an expression of the subjective space that is the basis for for mimesis, for, for the mimetic process that is part of the formation of our psyche, the maturation of our psyche. And, um, you know, as again, as kind of sidebars, one of the reasons Kafka looms as such an important writer 
um, because he was in some way transcribing the contours of that primordial psychic space. Um, uh, as he was doing a number of things, which is why he was so profound, um, because he was also expressing um, exile, anti-Semitism, um, alienation, all kinds of things. Uh, but but so theater. Um, Jan Kott, the Polish critic, has a great book, many years old now, called Shakespeare: Our Contemporary, and he talks about King Lear, which was. A, significant play for Beckett, for Melville, for lots of people. Mm -hmm. And he says the Mad Tom on the Heath scene where um, uh, the old man, the Gloucester, I guess, is, is led up the mountain except he's blind and he's not being led up a mountain at all, right? He's just being walked across the stage. And um, that scene for Cot, the truth of that scene was a theatrical truth that could not exist anywhere except on stage. And that um, if you filmed it, you ran into this problem of verisimilitude in film. And Artaud understood this too. Artaud wrote a play called Jet of Blood. Mm -hmm. And the final stage directions in Jet of Blood are severed penises fall from the sky. <laughs> Now on stage, you can have roses thrown from sure. the rafters, right? right? There's all kinds of ways to magically represent that because theater is magical. Right. Um, in film, you can't do that. You can't film roses coming. They look stupid. It looks like roses. Right. Um, and you wonder, what what is this? Um, you would have, you know, Wes Craven's latex artist come on and make several pieces, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't very know. Yeah. It wouldn't work, yeah. is the point. And, and um, again, Herbert Blau understood this, a number of um, that sort of last generation of, of theater theorists understood this. Um, so, so what happened... There was a there was a point at which, as modernism waned, you know, you had a generation of of Genet and Ionesco and Pinter, and um, uh, it it sort of was. I mean, Howard Barker. There's a few people, but but um, the theater of representation if you want to call it naturalism, realism, whatever, the theater of representation finally um, subsumed and absorbed those radical theater artists that were the, the last gasp of modernism. And, uh, and that's what you have being churned out today in MFA programs. You don't have anything else. Now, there are you know, people will object to that and say, well, but you have Robert Wilson, you have, you know, whoever. Um, but Robert Wilson is finally kitsch to my mind um, and, and empty kitsch at that and kind of reactionary <laughs> empty kitsch, if you want to push me. Um, uh, Go ahead. So, so I, think that, I think that, no, you don't theater as we know it institutional theater, theater where you buy a ticket and you walk into the theater and there's a proscenium stage or some kind of stage and you win. I mean, there is still some kind of magic that happens no matter what. It may be fleeting today. It usually is. But um, because but that, re that relationship between an audience of organized listening and, you know, in Shakespeare's time, they said, let's go listen to a play. They didn't say, let's go watch a play. Um, that That is, has been forgotten somehow. And um, I've always said that the stage represents the conscious mind. The offstage is the unconscious, in a sense. And great plays always take place offstage. Um, in Greek tragedy, the action is always offstage. And, uh, you know, this is a complicated discussion, but, but um, if, 
if you take children to the theater for the first time, to live theater, at intermission, and I've said this a million times, but at, at intermission, they will run up to look into the wings off stage because they know something, that's the origin of something that nobody has told me about. You know, there's a secret out there somewhere. <laughs> um, and it's a little bit like when you had, you know, medieval maps um, during the age of exploration, uh, the known world ended. And so they just drew sea monsters. Right, and stuff. Right. <laughs> we didn't know things. The offstage is where those sea monsters are, right? right. That's the <laughs> unconscious. And this is a society of control. So they, you know, it's a society that that um, reflexively looks to eliminate those sea monsters and any evidence that they ever existed, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so they create work that is, you know, about mostly the, the problems of the bourgeoisie, um, the neurotic problems of the bourgeoisie. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing metaphysical left um, in theater. Uh, I once did a class. When we were studying the texts of Mamet, early Mamet, um, and Harold Pinter. And sort of halfway through, I said, "Who's the who's the better, the more important writer?" And everybody said Pinter. And I said, "Well, yeah, but why? Why? Why do you think that?" And I had a student say, "Because he's metaphysical." And I thought that's such a great answer, and mm -hmm. that's true. That's the difference, um, and and it's possibly how one can um, separate great art from from banality. I don't know, right. but so yeah, I think I think it's a very hard time for theater, and I think the solution, the new the new answer to this colonizing of what we know of as theater. Um, hasn't emerged yet. It will. There will be. There will be a form that comes out of this that is new because humans can't exist without that theatrical um, dynamic, that relationship, because it is, it is the basis for consciousness. Now, you know, um, I think consciousness is under assault. There's a war on consciousness right now, but. Um, but what we'll see, you know, if we survive. Right. You have know, something to say about that? Well, you know, regarding this whole theater, which is why you're here, we want to focus on the theatrics that are taking place right now. Um, so the it seems as though when you talk about theater and the sea monsters that are, you know, hidden from the children, you know, on the, you know, backstage. It feels as though we're living in this um, current dynamic where you have a lot of these informed types that are telling you about the sea monsters. And so as a result, you have a lot of different theatrics going on, whether it's the pantomiming of, you know, virtue signaling where they're putting on the mask or getting a vaccine, or you have the people that are describing you know what's really going on behind the scenes. So it just seems like this this huge uh, play, <laughs> you know, this huge display of theater. Um, and I think you've mentioned that on Aesthetic Resistance on your podcast with Corey Morningstar and Varun Mather and various others. You 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 go back to this a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, because I think I think I mean it feels obvious, right? On on one level. Um, the vaccine um, is clearly not about uh, what vaccines normally are about, because, uh, I mean, um, why does anybody want a vaccine for a virus that you have a 99.97% chance of surviving? Um, it's, a, it's a symptom suppressant and, and little more, but, but it has taken on allegorical resonance right um it's it's uh, a, a baptism it's a purification uh ritual it's all of these things uh for for people um and and so you get on social media people saying i took my vaccine today you know <laughs> and and 
when does that ever happen? When has in history have people gone around um, advertising their medical treatment that way? Um, <laughs> I can't think of a precedent, but you know, it's because it's not about medicine. It's not right. about your physical health or anything. It's about um, a desperate need in a in a terrorized populace uh, for redemption and renewal. Mm. And um, the vaccine seems to promise that. And so it becomes, it quickly becomes symbolic and, and metaphorical. And um, <clears throat> it, it, it won't satisfy that need is the problem. So there's going to be repercussions from um, this failed purification <laughs> ritual. You're going to need more vaccines. We know that. Yeah. Um, but but it's never going to be satisfactory, I don't think. And um, hence, uh, you know, uh, the you know the Great Reset is diabolical, and and I guess we all kind of know that. And you just have to read the Klaus Schwab. Um, uh text to understand how diabolical it is but there's a lot of agendas there's a funny kind of vanguard out there of the billionaire class the one percent class that is um about depopulation and about control and about making the world safe for the one percent and um getting rid of the dirty dark skinned poor people of the world who serve no purpose and on and on and on. And it's why there's a big push for AI. Um, suddenly this has become a talking point everywhere, like, oh, mm -hmm. AI. Um, and, and the truth is that that's a failed um, experiment anyway. AI can't do all of the things yeah. that they keep claiming it can do. Um, Herbert Dreyfus wrote, a thing about what computers can't do. And that was 40 years ago. It's still a completely relevant text. Um, all of the forensic AI stuff that's connected to that, whether it's facial recognition, even fingerprints, but, you know, bite mark analysis and blood splatter and all this, none of this stuff works, you know, right. um, even CCTV. I think there was a statistic in, in from the London police department, something like 3% of fate um, of felonies even used CCTV. Um, it's, it's just all of that's unreliable stuff, but that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to the, the, the apparatus of control it doesn't matter they're um they're about manufacturing a narrative uh regardless of reality that um that will continue to terrorize and, and frighten people and um and and you know alter their behavior and um yeah. further habituate them to screens and social media and all the rest well along those lines i mean what we're seeing with ai is you know it's being rolled out in very um uh simplistic ways that that you know things that you know, machines are good at you know going through lots and lots of data and you know picking things out and i mean they're even using it to you know write um, basic stories that, that get placed into, you know, websites or whatever. And it's usually, you know, these, these stories are, you know, news stories, they're rebuttals to, you know, the so-called um, uh, news stories or the you know, conspiracy theorists or the unreliable news workers. And because it's AI, it's able to like put out 30 articles for every um, you know, counter articles to every um, you know article that that is written by a so-called conspiracy theorist. And so it's good at those kinds of things, but it's certainly not good at some of the things that everybody's been claiming it's going to be doing in the future. Um, we did a piece on you know, the future of work, and you know we're 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 seeing that you know a lot of the claims that um, that uh, have been made about you know, what's coming down the pike just are not going to be coming down the pike for a while and so they're finding um uh, bridges and, and and ways to 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 fill the gap between 
you know, the robots taking over and and, <laughs> and what we're dealing with now, you know, and, and so and and back, you know, back to, again, to another point that you made a moment ago, and I'll let you, you know, speak to both of these things, um, you know, the, the masking and the, the adoption of the masks and the, the, the signaling and the distancing and all these things, do you feel like it's, it has something to do with um, a loss of feeling um, any sort of, like having a voice at all. I mean, even among the more privileged managerial class people who are the most adopted, it feels like they live a very plastic existence. <laughs> and and this is a means of them being able to take back some sort of voice and be able to say something, even if it is very surface. Um yeah, I mean I'm I hate to say I'm losing some because my speakers are so bad. I lost some of that, but, but I, yeah. Um, if, if we're talking about, uh, um, a loss of community, I think, um, is a really crucial issue. And, uh, it is something else that has been consciously, um, eroded so people look for these artificial communities whether you know and and, and it's connected to the, the 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 sort of the covid master narrative um uh i don't know i i feel sometimes as if um i'm still living in the shadow of the reagan uh dream somehow you know the destruction of unions and and um on a on a grassroots level and the lockdown of course was part of um preventing any grassroots organizing i mean there were curfews people weren't allowed to gather in more than five people and you know, groups of more i mean none of this made any rational sense but but it served to um to to both terrorize people make them afraid and to prevent um face-to-face -face discussions about any of this stuff and uh and you know Corey Morningstar I'll plug Corey Mornings I think people need to read her her page the wrong kind of green mm -hmm. because it is it is it is almost the bible for dissecting uh the reset and and all the stuff attendant to this so yeah i i don't know i'm i'm both pessimistic and optimistic you know i i i try not to be pessimistic because um cynicism is a is a i think it was adorno said cynicism is just another mode of conformity <laughs> um, one shouldn't be cynical uh and and so one tries not to be and and to look at the you know the fact that there are millions and millions of people out there um largely working class uh who who haven't bought into this um this whole story over the last year and a half at all uh and yet you know there are places canada um, that is still entirely locked down. Uh, the UK is perilously close to that, uh, New Zealand. Um, you know, and, and when you try to point out to people that, that they lifted restrictions in Texas and nothing happened, there was no mass death, you know, um, it, 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 it wasn't the predicted catastrophe that, uh, that TV pundits told you it was going to be. Uh, that their eyes glaze over because it's it's a contradiction. They don't have um, an ability to, to to analyze, I guess, and and that speaks to the destruction of education, I suppose. But um, I think I think diminishing returns have set in in terms of the master narrative. I think a lot of people have woken up. So you know, we'll see what comes out of that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, bringing it back to you um, a bit, do you um, you miss teaching? Um, and do you have any uh, projects that you're working on right now? Well, I mean, I always have projects I'm working on. Sure. Um, right. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't. <clears throat> I'm I'm like 
programmed to write plays. You know? <laughs> and, and so I continue to write them, even though I know there's precious little chance they'll get produced. Um, and, but my writing is more about um, the search for a new way to do theater. And some of that is in the blog. I spend, you know, um, uh, a lot of time writing these blog pieces and and constructing them. And, and um, it's, it's where a lot of my sort of creative energy goes these days. Um, and I got a book out of it, um, Aesthetic Resistance. Um, on the Mises Press there, uh, but but uh, you know it it's still um, a strangely solitary endeavor. You know I miss the community of theater. I miss working with actors and and designers and and I miss uh, that engagement with live audiences. And uh, I hope I can do it again someday. But since I just turned seventy two days ago. <laughs> Happy um, birthday. I, 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 uh, pardon? Happy birthday. <laughs> um, you know, so so it, it's it's um but it's a search for, for something. And I think the the serious um I'm gonna do a podcast soon with um with Guy Zimmerman again, who's a who's a writer in Los Angeles who um I've worked with in theater for a long time. I did the podcast with Martin Epstein. Um, where we were talking about theater, because I think we all are looking for the solution to to the the, the situation that that we find ourselves in, which um, is rather dire, actually. But um, for me, uh, yeah, I have projects that are always ongoing, and um, in the meantime, I do the blog and uh, the podcasts and partly because they're therapeutic for me. Mm -hmm. um, and interviews like this with you guys, you know, it's, it's, it feels good to talk to people about this stuff um, because in your daily life, it's, it's hard to find um, that kind of uh, discussion anymore. It didn't used to be, but it is now. And yeah. um, uh We'll we'll see. You know, I I just that's where I end with everything as well. We'll see. We'll see. And there's people crying. You know, and um, uh, I believe in emergent properties. There there will be an emerging um, answer to this. Um, I hope sooner rather than later, but one never knows. Well, um, certainly the uh, aesthetic resistance program podcast is uh, is something that we like to listen to. That um, it meets my uh, my radio uh, fetish need, <laughs> whatever. Um, but also, you know, it, it's discourse and discussion um, that you just don't hear anywhere else. And I really do appreciate that. And the guests that you oh, have um, as your panel, um, I love how. Uh, you all play off of each other or work with each other, you know, in your conversation. Um, and it's, it's, it's really refreshing to hear um, that type of uh, thought and um, the time that you take or something as opposed to just rushing through things. And uh, just a, a side note, we are going to have Hiroki uh, Hamada uh, um, on our program in a few weeks as well. Oh, good. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, no, I, I, we've been very lucky with the podcast that that people have agreed to be on it. Omar Khan in Sri Lanka, and he's written. You go to his blog. He's written some terrific stuff on COVID. Varun Mater, um, in New Delhi. Corey Morningstar, of course, in Toronto. Hiroyuki in New York. Uh, Johan Edebo in the north of Sweden. We're kind of scattered everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, I asked them, I went to all of them at, at some point and said, do you, do you want to do this podcast? Thinking, you know, maybe they would, maybe not. They were all very enthusiastic. Yes, let, you know, because I think we all in this community of resistance um, are looking for a place to, 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 um, to speak to talk about this stuff. 
um, because there are fewer and fewer places to do that. And um, there's, there's no left party that is meaningful where I think once upon a time people were able to talk about political issues and, and, and educate themselves. Um, and uh, the artistic uh, opportunities, the, the opportunities for, for discussion of art, whether it's theater or painting or anything, are also, you know, dried up. There aren't many. And so, uh, you know, I have found people have been not just willing, but enthusiastic to take part. And, and I'm sure they are with your um your your interviews here and i'm really glad here is going to be on yeah, um, I'm here too. yeah and uh yeah uh because it's um it's dire you know it's dire out there i i worry about my young sons you know i have three of them and what will all of this look like when they're 18 or 20 you know mm-hmm. um cuz i spent my youth traveling and you know um across the United States, around the world, everywhere, uh, and, and tried to work as little as I possibly could. And um, I don't know if that opportunity for that kind of, um, uh, you know, organic education is going to exist for them in the same way. I don't know. Yeah, uh, we don't either. Well. Um, we are getting to the, uh, the end of our time with you. Um, I know you had a tough time. Um, any any last thoughts? Or? Um, well, first of all, I just I want to thank you for um, talking theater with us, and uh, it's you know it's been a part of my life in the past, and I really miss it. Um, I miss you know being directed. You know, I miss being in that place where the audience can, can can discover something with me. Uh, I recently, or not recently, but years ago, a director told me that the most uh, important, you know, uh, the most important thing that you can have with theater is the act of discovery um, coming out of your audience, where the the story then pivots, you know, and it moves it moves into another direction once the the act of discovery is made, and you know the the thespians and the actors and the and the the people who have the craft help the audience get to that act of discovery. Um, so I think that um, theater and art is more important than anything right now so that people can come to their own discovery yeah i agree i agree and and you know that theater is such a potentially dangerous medium for mm-hmm. the status quo for the system mm-hmm. that there there's so many elements and of course i've talked about it on the blog but other people have too i mean that actors on stage in front of an audience, a collective focused listening to a text being recited with actors, you know, um, performing the voice of a missing author. I mean, there's all these elements, right? And there's repetition. I had a whole blog post about the rather profound implications of repetition as it's manifested um, in theater. And, And that's a, that's a, a huge and important topic, but but these are these are complex, difficult discussions. You know, Kierkegaard said, "Difficult questions require difficult answers." Um, it you can't make it easy. People always say, "Oh, yeah, but you're so inaccessible." You know, you have to like to, like speak so people can understand you. I said, "I can't do that." You know, mm-hmm. I can only speak the way because I'm trying to get at something. And this is the only way I know how. And um, maybe it will encourage people to to learn how to to read this stuff and talk about it themselves. Because the educational system won't do it. You're going to have to do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. That is true. Um. So I. At this point, I think what you would do is you would mute him so that our okay. audience could hear us better because yeah. they're so very. Yeah. Um, 
So I think that uh, despite some sound issues and losing some power, uh, <laughs> um, this was a really wonderful conversation. I agree. What would you yeah. like to say? Um, well, thank you. It's really fun to do. Oh, I appreciate oh, um, you asking. Go to uh, and we have we'll put the links into the uh, the, uh, the show afterwards. Um, I don't know if uh, we have so much of a volume problem. I think it's more of a feedback issue. But anyway. Um, we are, we're just trying to figure these things out as we go along. Um, all the same, uh, uh, I think that uh, reading John's work on his blog and listening to the um, aesthetic resistance are great ways to um, learn more about uh, so many things. John, you are so prolific in and so vast in the in what you describe and how you describe it. It's it's. I found myself looking things up as I was reading. <laughs> right. Um, but that's good, right? Because it's like musicians say, you know, it's like you only learn something, you know, if you're not the best one in the room. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you. It was really um, a pleasure to be on here. And, um, you know, I appreciate uh, what you guys are doing. So, well, thank you. We appreciate you. <laughs> We're very happy that um, you, uh, you you agreed to join us and uh, and you know come on to uh, pull quote and, uh, and we we'll, hope to have you back. Yes, and we'll be right back with you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, um, uh, that was great. Yes. <laughs> now we were troubled and plagued with. Uh -oh. Did uh -oh, we what? lose him? Uh, we lost him. We lost him. Okay. Sorry. I think you might have. Uh, yeah, sorry. Bring okay. him back. Bring I can't bring him back. Okay. <laughs> He's going to have right. to come back. Um, okay. So you can text him. Yeah. Uh, so clearly we've had some uh, difficulties with uh, with technology today. Um, we actually had a power outage in the middle of the conversation. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we want to thank you, you, everybody, for joining us today and all of your wonderful feedback. Yeah, um, thank you for letting us know about the sound issues we were having. Right, and we will bring, bring John Stepling on again and have a more, you know, a deeper conversation about some of the things that we're all experiencing. Please support our work by becoming a patron. Uh, and we will include all of the links, but we're we're heading up to past our ninety minute mark. So what we're going to go ahead and do is end the end the talk now, and we will uh, see you again. We're actually doing another pull quote episode this Friday with a couple of uh, one woman who runs her own uh, cafe who experienced some challenges and difficulties here in the Pittsburgh area during the pandemic and another woman who is a manager of a cafe in North Carolina. We're going to have them both on at the same time. Mm -hmm. So please join us for that this Friday. Okay. And again, please support our work, become a patron, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and we will see you on Friday. All right, great. Okay. okay. Um, and let's see here. We've got, oh, well, before that, before we go that, uh, one more thing, uh, we do, um, we are working artists, um, and let's see, where is our ticker? It's gone away. Well, okay. well that's okay. That's I, okay. I mentioned you could become a patron. You yeah, could support you us that way. Uh, you can also join Rockfin. Um, I'm and sorry, I wasn't. <laughs> again, also, if you, you know, if you like our work, uh, patreon.com slash book of hours. And uh, again, we're coming back. We're, we're coming up on the the ninety minute mark, so we need to we need to sign off. But I really appreciate the patrons we do have, and I appreciate everybody that has given their feedback for today's episode of Pull Quote. Please join us Friday um, for our next episode of Pull Quote. Yeah. Okay? All right, great. We'll see you then. Thanks, guys. All right, bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Book of Hours are artists here to empower and embolden your response to the constant negative sound bites that attack your news and social media feeds. In order to continue making the video essays and art you've come to enjoy, we need your support. Make a one-time donation or become a patron. Thank you.